Hello and welcome to Wisdom Wednesday. Today's episode is episode 19 and I'll let Darren tell you all about that here in a couple of minutes. But first I wanted to announce the winner of our lovely Iconics t-shirt. Uh, and uh, this giveaway's winner is Darwin C. And we've contacted them and we'll be sending them a t-shirt shortly. So congratulations, Darwin. Thanks for entering. Everybody keep an eye out in case we do another giveaway sometime down the road. And uh, beyond that, though, I'm going to shoot you on over here to Dr. Feingrit and let him <laughs> tell you all about episode number 19, where we're thinking outside the box. Darren? Hey, good one. I like that one. We're going to have a blast, <laughs> blast of confidence, but... They go outside the box. Let's do that, right? Um, one of my favorite topics when I teach seminars is this, matter of fact, because uh, it gets into our homestead. You know, it's, we work in a business world that's quick, efficient. Uh, we're trying to get jobs out yesterday. Um, but this is kind of a, a subject where it can be closer to your heart, whether it's a rock or an ornament or a sun catcher, something that's outside the box. And what that means is items that are blasted outdoors typically, or you can bring them into the comfort of your cabinet, blast them, and then put the item back outdoors. So we're going to cover a few popular items for this time of year. And um, I'm excited for that. And we are going to touch on some bricks on our next episode because a lot of customers were asking for that. One thing I wanted to mention quick is before we've had a lot of customers ask me, I want to see some of your old tricks. Okay. I've had a lot of different things I've discussed with customers over the years. And one of those is abrasive flow. It's a big topic in the summertime where it's high humidity. So I have some tricks here on how to diagnose your issue quicker than later. Um, here I got some coffee pot, <laughs> or coffee cups rather, but you say pot on it, right? You might wonder what that is. So stay tuned for afterwards. I'm going to show you a tip to make your abrasive flow a lot smoother and uh, much better in your process. And we'll do a question and answer as well, as always. So stay tuned for the video and we'll be right back with you shortly. Enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome back to Wisdom Wednesday. Dr. Feingrid here for you once again. Uh, today's episode is gonna cover some items that are normally outside the sand carving box. Uh, so items today are gonna to be shown like your ceramic flower pot. We're gonna cover the rock getting sandblasted. I actually created a jewelry item as well, or a rock you could hang from your soffit or whatever. And also we're gonna cover some sun catchers made out of crystal. So those are the items today, just on a smaller scale. I'm not outside to show you how big of an item you can do, like a boulder or a huge flower pot or a big sun catcher. But this at least will give you the idea, hopefully to uh, expand your horizon, uh, make products outside the box. Because they do make portable pressure pots outside of what we have in our shop here today. So we're gonna cover uh, some good ideas and stay tuned. All right, so here we are with our product line today on today's episode. And we're gonna use the R5 photoresist film, self-adhesive, rather tacky to work on just about any product. And what we're gonna do is we have the artwork created on AccuBlack material. It was printed with Epson. You also use a Canon or HP printer. If you have further questions on that, you can just let me know. Um, Prints out very dark and dense. Then you put on the R5 material, you expose it, water develop it, dry it. Very simple to work with. Now, the next step is when you work with the R5 material, we're gonna apply it to each item. You wanna clean the item first with a little glass cleaner, alcohol for, or uh, ammonia free. Just give a little clean. Okay, so a little swipe across and that'll clean up the items. On rock as well, if it's very dirty, um, some people actually sandblast it. Give it a good sandblast it first and that cleans the rock. Um, little tip there, okay? Gives it a nice surface to 
has a filament here too as well. So we have our smart jig we'll be using as well. So these are the ingredients here today. They are five photoresist film, the AccuBlack inkjet material, ceramic flower pot, a glass for crystal sun catcher. And I'm gonna do a rock that's already got a hole in it. So I did that with the sand carver. Pretty neat trick, right? And then I'm gonna blast this other rock item I found outside. So, and our smart jig with the squeegees and the wire wheels. So these are our ingredients here today. And my next step is I'm gonna apply it and it starts sound blasting. So, hope you time. So when you're working with rocks, they're porous, they're very smooth, okay? They might be dirty. As I mentioned, you can clean your rock either with uh, high pressure water, but then you have to let it dry completely before you use it, and that's time consuming. Um, the other trick is to sandblast it ahead of time, and that gives it a smooth surface, more texture to adhere to. However, sometimes the rocks are still kind of a, an angry animal to work with, okay? Because when you apply the film, even if it's very tacky, you get it stuck in those spots, Sometimes the carrier release is a little challenging because you can't really get it to stick on every part of that rock, right? Might be a little divot, might be a porous area, might not be an open area to remove the carrier. So a little tip there is to create like a little starter. So what I do is I just apply the film to like a piece of glass, or in this case, I'm gonna use a piece of ceramic, pull over the edge and flick it, okay? Now I got like a little edge to start with, okay? So now when I put it on the rock, I got an edge to peel very easily. So I'm gonna apply the film, squeeze it really well. And I'm gonna go to that area where I started, right here, okay? And you can take the carrier off ahead of time too, okay? Now you just push, it's that simple. The more pressure you put on the film, the better it's gonna stick. And when you see it kind of darken, that means the adhesion is really working for you. So you want a darker film. You don't want that light color. It's not sticking to anything. So that's your indicator that it's sticking really well. Little tip of the day. All right, I'm gonna show you a rock a lot of people use for jewelry. Um, people like to hang rocks because it's hard to get it to adhere to a building, right? Uh, without rope or without a device. So I put a hole in it. So I can rope, you know, a string through there, a rope through it, a chain, uh, whatever you, uh, rope light, whatever you wanna use, okay? And that's usually sound carved. You just put your nozzle right on that item, hold it, your nozzle one spot for about 15, 20 seconds, and you're gonna have a hole looking just like this, right in your rock. Very easy, very smooth. All right, so this is the image I'm gonna put on the rock. Another tip to get the film to adhere, because sometimes it may not stick well, even with self-adhesive film like this. So, if the rock is cold to the touch, which normally they are, right? If you heat it up, the film's gonna stick really well to it. Okay, if the rock doesn't, or you can't heat it up for any reason by like an oven or your film dryer, you don't have a device to heat the rock. What I suggest then is to reactivate the glue on the film to make it more sticky. And so what I do in that case is take some glass cleaner and just dab the film a little bit with glass cleaner. Uh, Windex would even work to make it more sticky. Okay, some people use additional glue as well. If you do that, put it on the film, not on the rock. If you put it on the rock, you have more cleanup later on, and you might stain it. So put the glue on the film itself. See if you're gonna use additional glue. Now, when I put the film on, I have the same challenges, because I didn't heat the rock. I didn't uh, um, put any glue on here. I'm just using the film, just like it comes off my release paper. So what I'm gonna do is I apply it, right, and I gotta, situation where the carrier might be hard to get off again because it's not really sticking to a good spot like I would on glass or ceramic. So what I do is I fold it over the edge on ceramic again like this, okay, and then flick it. Boom. 
do the I got a starter right there. Very easy, very good trick. Now when I apply the film, it's going to be on a bumpy surface. It's very irregular, which is fine with their films because they're very pliable. They'll stick to just about anything. Okay. So you work on your image area only. You don't need to worry about all here because your tape's going to be on that spot. So work in your image area. Apply good pressure. And then like I showed you, I have a little start with my carrier. So basically I, I usually rip it off, but in this case, it's still slow on you. As you can see, and you just kind of push down with your thumbs. And you can see the film darken. Okay. And then you run your wire wheel across, pop any air bubbles in that membrane area, and then you tape it off and sandblast it. All right, I'm going to do a sun catcher right now. It's made out of crystal, and the technique I want to show here is what we call reverse sandblasting. So do go on embossing. Basically, just the background is being sand card instead of the foreground. So the tip here, and this is for people that use wrap -a mask as well, the dry film from us. When you work with the sandblaster on reverse images like this, when you run your nozzle, trace your lettering. Because I know most of you use silicon carbide abrasive, which gives you that flashlight effect. And I'll show you in the carving how it works. But you'll run your abrasive right over the lettering like you're tracing it. And that, what that does is it bonds the film to the glass. Because like I mentioned in other episodes, the glass is not perfectly straight all the time. It's got little dips in there that are not visible with the naked eye. So when you run your nozzle across, it pushes the film down very tight, and it'll never lift up on you. So no blow-offs. Like the tip on here, if you trace around the outside, if you have a very, very thin tip, if you trace the outside, that tip's going to stay down. It won't lift up on you. So just do a little trace over your lettering and your outside. And you'll never, ever have a blow-off. Once again, I'm using the 180 silicon carbon abrasive, also known as fine grit. Okay. And what I'm going to do is pull it out four to six inches away and run my silicon carbide right over the lettering. You can see the lettering just kind of trays, pull down itself around the outside perimeter, pull down the outside really well. There you have it. There's your reverse edge. Very easy if you do the tracing effect instead of the back and forth motions. So the R5 material, I want to go a little bit deeper, give it more perceived value, more three-dimensional. I can go about a quarter inch deep with the five mil material on glass and crystal. I like to show it angles, I can create like a little bit of a curl in there, a little bit of a dimension. I just create a little bit of a carve. That light's a really good indicator. If you see that mark, you know you're blasting at all times. That's very critical in this process. All right, this one, this is a ceramic flower pot. Uh, you could also order ceramic or porcelain coated product. Some of these materials are very thick on the coating, so some are more challenging than others. This one here, I'm gonna actually use a technique where I do little circles. And what that does is like an orbital sander. It's gonna basically remove material in a kind of a vortex or a um, tornado kind of action. So it creates more of a, a cleaner, and faster effect on ceramic. So without further ado, I'm gonna put this in the machine and start blasting away. So here in the ceramic power pot, I have a lip up here. So I pushed my film into that lip. It's very pliable, so you have no issues getting detail up to that point or even over that point. Uh, the other factor here is it's ceramic. It's got a very thick coating on there. Okay, so we use what we call an orbital sander kind of sandblast look. So you can put your nozzle in small little circles, it's going to penetrate through that coating quicker and it's going to clean it off quicker. So 
the glass, you're gonna hold it at a same angle you would on glassware. Hold it with the hand right inside the pot, nice and comfortable. And then basically I'm gonna blast at 40 to 50 PSI with 180 silicon carbide once again, because it's a fine grit. And um, I, I like using carbide because it gets the flash out effect and it's more sharp and more aggressive. And uh, it's, I, 150, a quartz of it would be better if you're doing a lot of ceramic. Uh, but like I said, in all these videos, 180 can do it all. The reason why I pick 40 to 50 is because it's a five mil resist. It's 10 PSI per mil thickness. So a five mil up to 50 PSI, right? So here we go. So that nice carbide sparking on there, removing my coating instantly. Like I said, if I was using aluminum oxide or about lower air pressure, or maybe if I was doing the side-by-side -side technique, it would take a little bit longer. But these little circles are really going to penetrate what they're still here. I don't. Very, very quick once you get that orbital little look going. This is giving the illustration to go back and forth like this. That's all it looks. It takes a lot longer, right? You go back side to side. You do a circle. Straight area. A lot of questions I get with blasting ceramic too is what if I go too deep? Because the most ceramic you have what we call a white primer underneath. So the primer is usually white. So when you hit that white primer, you stop. And that gives you a white color. It's protected for the life of the product. In this case, there's no primer. It's just a ceramic material, which is beige. So it's very porous. So if I was going to put this outdoors for a long period, I would put like a varnish or a clear coat over this area to protect it for longer years. Because otherwise you might get like soil deposits or, you know, colored product in there staining that area. So put like a varnish in there because it's very slippery. So nothing I adhere to it. Okay. So there you have it. There's our sandblasted porcelain ceramic pot. With 180 carbide abrasive. If you don't wear gloves, you do like what I always do in my classes. You give yourself a round of applause. Give up your hands. All right, now we're gonna rock on here. We're gonna do two rocks. Uh, one is the jewelry item with the hole in it, and the other one's just a traditional rock. I'm gonna do these with R5. I'm also gonna blast at only 30 PSI. And the reason for that is when I blast at a lower air pressure, I'm gonna move my nozzle at a slower pace, holding the film down. So that way the film doesn't lift up. So slower wins the race when you do rock or any porous item. Because once that film lifts up, you have a issue on hand, right? So to eliminate that, blast our lower air pressure, move your nozzle slower. The other thing that helps too when you're doing a lot of rocks is apply the film and let it sit for 24 hours. If you let the film sit on there for a long period, the film bonds. Another way to speed that up is to expose it to light. Okay, since we're doing outdoor products, you probably have an outdoor source. Put the film applied on the rock in the sunlight for an hour or two, and that film is gonna bond way better as well. So a couple of tricks on getting the film to stick better on rock. So here we are again at 30 PSI. Roman my nozzle very slowly across the mask area. Slower than I've done on ceramic and glass items. So without further ado, 
I'm gonna start blasting away. All right, we're gonna use silicon carbide 180 grit, the fine grit, right? And I'm using our five footer in this film. Now, as you can see here, I'm wearing a glove. You, you, I don't wear this very often. Uh, the reason is I've been married for 21 years and I wear a wedding ring. So that metal is sandblastable. So I don't wanna hit that wedding ring and you know create a matte finish, all right? So I wear a glove. Also, when you put the rock in your hand, you know, if you're not used to it, you hit your hand, it's gonna tickle a little bit. Okay, so it's a little uncomfortable at first. So if wear a glove, that's why I recommend with smaller items like rocks. Okay, so here we go. Without further ado, 30 PSI. We're very slow. Because that five mil is not gonna burn off, it's a resist. I'm just gonna show you here. I'm holding it in one spot even. That resist is not blowing off, it's not gonna melt away. It's designed for deep carving capability on rock, right? So I just want to do this one side here. See how deep I'll be able to get already, at least an eighth of an inch, but even with the 180 fine grit. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do the whole image. So very slow again, so you bond everything down. So like the little counters, the little islands in there. Hold your nozzle at one spot. Don't even move. You can see that film is just bonding. It's creating heat on there. So remember I mentioned earlier when you, when you, um, we're good rocks is going to heat the rock ahead of time so the film adheres better. Well, I didn't do that. I left the rock cold and I applied the film, which is what most people do, right? You're going to speed, you're going to crunch. But when you sandblast, you create that heat on the rock. So I'm actually getting it to bond at this point. So it's another time saver. When you move your nozzle slow, you're heating the rock. Okay. Very good points when you work with items like this. Very slow motion. You have a thick film like a five mil, works wonderful. Three mil would work as well. The trick when you work with thinner film like a three, because a lot of my customers use R3 on rock, and I'm gonna go deeper, is you give it time to cool off in between passes. If you do that, you can use a thinner resist. Also, if you blast at a lower pressure, it's lower frictional heat. So, a couple little tips there. But I'm gonna go deeper because this is my five mil mass. Again, there's no glue on this rock. I did not heat the rock. I used it right from the outside. I just cleaned it barely. A little bit of abrasive, but yeah, you can see just by going really slow at a lower air pressure, everything's gonna hear just fine. I'm really going deep. I've got about an eighth of an inch right now. I can go probably up to a quarter inch deep on these. Some some rocks are a little more stubborn than others. Like I've done lava rock. Lava rock is very, very brittle, very stubborn. Um, so it should take a lot longer on that product. But any kind of river rock or agates, things like that, they're very easy to sand carve. Quartz is another good rock. Yeah, you know, there's anything that's brittle is gonna easily sand carve. So there you go. I got an eighth of an inch carve with detail. All my islands are intact. And that's because of my slow blasting technique and a lower air pressure. I'm going to color fill this one with black paint. So I'm going to use my air gun. There you have it. So the same thing applies to this R5 again, same air pressure. As you can see here, I got a little bit more curvature, more irregularity. So I'm going to have to move the rock. So it's a little tip, move the rock instead of your nozzle. If you move your nozzle, you have no idea, you might be shooting up here or down here. So if you move your rock, you always see that spark on there. Okay, so you never lose your flashlight effect. So that's another tip, move your rock, not your nozzle. Okay, so here we go. Again, I got my inside of my ether, I don't wanna lose that. So I'm gonna hold my nozzle in one spot to bond it in there with that frictional heat. Okay, now that I got that really intact, you can see how deep that is, that inside of the E is not gone. That's a fine point on there too. So anybody can do this at home just by taking your time on these items. If you make a mistake, you can't really fix it on a rock. Here's a, I'm moving the rock as you can see here, instead of my nozzle. 
That's because I'm working on a curved surface and I want to be able to see where my spark is. Rocks are very fun to do, very good hobby, it's very good profit as well. Um, I like to put a lot of holes in them or, or uh, little countersunk holes for like candles. Um, I also like to do uh, a lot of bigger rocks. I put big boulders in here at times. Uh, I think it looks amazing outside some of these uh, doorsteps. So there's been a lot of, a lot of variety over the years and they're very, uh, Attractive, very profitable because you can put them in a garden, you can put them outside anywhere. This item I'm going to leave without a color bill because it's got a dark rock appearance. So when they blast it, it turns gray. So I'm not going to color bill this one. So that way I can keep it more realistic outdoors. A lot of times, too, what I do in the winter time is I'll actually color fill it with white snow. I'll take my rocks outside, I'll lay them out flat get snow on them and then I'll wipe the snow and the snow remains in my etched area. So it's a color fill with snow. So yeah, just being creative out there. Um, people use caulk a lot or paint. Um, any kind of uh, material is gonna fill in just nicely on these. So here's our 1 8 carve on a river rock. And we remove the mask without painting on this one. All right, so you can see as a rock on the dark one, it got a dark surface and my gray edge. Okay, so it's good contrast. I don't need a color fill. On this rock, however, when I carved it, the deeper I went, it does get a little bit lighter, like most products do when you sand carve. However, it looks almost the same color, right? So not much contrast. So what I do in this case is I'll color fill it. So I'm using my oil-based marker from Sharpie again, because it's a very clean process. If I use spray paint, it's going to get kind of messy. And let's say I wanted to color fill with different colors, like red, black, yellow, whatever. I could do that with these Sharpies all in one shot instead of having to wait for paints to dry. So I'm going to use the oil base. And that's important because the oil base will absorb into the porous surface that we created with sand carving. So that paint's going to remain in there for many, many years, 20 plus years. Okay. Even outdoors. So I'm going to just dab it in there. Punch it, I kind of hold it in. You can kind of see it comes out a little bit more when you push on the head of the paint marker here. Okay. So yeah, now you're starting to see it come out more fluidy. So you don't want to put a whole lot of paint because that's where people run into problems when they over paint items. The paint creates a shell and it's more messy and it creates or get the film off afterwards. So. so smaller rocks, you can do it this method. A bigger rock, I wouldn't use the marker. I'd use a regular oil-based enamel in a spray can, like a Belton or One Shot. I use rust -Oleum. Any automotive paint, again, is oil-based. So any of those are going to be fine. So here's our final reveal of what we've done today with the outdoor projects. Um, I did the glass sun catcher. So this one was carved rather deep. If you look up closely or at an angle, because sun catchers move around in the wind, right? So a different refraction, light coming in, you get different looks because the deeper the edge, the more light cavity. So the brighter the edge is. So you get different looks. So it's a neat little way to do sun catchers because of the depth you can achieve on glass, okay? The other one is the, uh, the rock. You use that as a jewelry item or a sign, anything where you need to hang it from a ceiling or a wall. 
a lot of people use it for jewelry, like I've shown here. So I put a hole in there with the sand carving machine. I have a nozzle in one spot until it created a hole. I don't do circles. I just leave it in one spot, and that's how I got my hole. Nice and smooth. Doesn't hurt on either side, so that's a big advantage. Also, it doesn't take very much time either. So easy way to create a rock with a hole, and I put an etch on there and I color filled it with an oil-based enamel. That enamel is going to last a lifetime. So a really good way to accent your rocks, uh, carry those around, and whatever. Then we move on to the other stones. Uh, this one's more of a smooth stone that I found along a river. So those are easy to apply the film, sand carve it, paint it, and remove. Smooth, so I can get about any mass to stick. No additional glue, no additional heating method. It's very easy. Now when I get into like this type of rock where it's got bumps and crevices, uh, valleys, pits, you name it, uh, it's a little challenging for the film to adhere, so that's where I'd use the tips that I mentioned earlier. Okay, here's another rock. I got a smooth, like a almost like an agate, carved really deep with a tiger paw. So it's a nice little way to offer to your customer, especially if you're in a tourist area. And then here's the other rock I did. So carved with no color fill because of the contrast capability without color. So those are some stone products, some outdoor ideas like the ceramic, add your flower. This is good for a lifetime outdoors. It will not fade. It will not discolor because it's got the uh, coating on there. And carve deep into a crescent. So another sun catcher idea for an award. So one last thing I want to mention on the stone side, and uh, as you know, this has been kind of a beginner, kind of introduce you into the stone market. I've done many classes with brick carving as well. I like to get more into that down the line if you're learning or want to learn that process. Here is the big part I want to mention on that. When I work with bricks, I'm using the same grit, 180 mesh, on all the projects we've done in this Dr. Fine Grit series. And that's the fine grit. If I was going to put a brick in my machine that I do crystal and glass and so forth, I wouldn't want any debris to fall back into my abrasive because that would contaminate it and lead to problems down the road. So the one brick I do not recommend first, do not, is the concrete bricks. Here's a concrete brick that you get at Home Depot. Uh, it's got aggregate in there. So little rocks in there, little pebbles that when you sand carve around that rock, because the rock is harder than the concrete material, the rock is going to fall off. Kind of break away and that falls back into your abrasive possibly so for that reason i do not recommend concrete bricks in the same machine as your blasting crystal and glass there are methods like i said that we can make it work and that could be a video, or a video down the line so here are the bricks that i do recommend and i'll start with the harder one this is a fire brick but he said the home group of stars as well doesn't have the aggregate in there but it's very stubborn Okay, 180 mesh abrasive would take a long time to get any depth. So for that reason, I recommend the clay. This one works really well in our machines. 180 mesh abrasive will cut into clay really well. The company makes them is called Belden, B-E-L-D-O-N. Doesn't contaminate your abrasive, easy to carve, easy to color fill. So again, the clay brick is the way to go with the 180 mesh abrasive. So that's the stone market, and uh, what I want to cover now a little bit of what we're going to cover in the next episode of Dr. Fine Grit, and that's going to be the crystal line. We talked a lot of glass. We're going to get to the more higher end products that are offered out there. This is Crosno Crystal. It's lead free, very thick, so I can go really deep into those objects. I'm going to blast with confidence as well because these items are not cheap. They're higher end product. So we're going to Tackle those next week on the next episode of Dr. Fine Grit and Wisdom Wednesday. So until then, have a blast and blast with confidence.
All right, Darren, once again, a nice uh, informational video. We even have a viewer who says uh, every time they watch, they learn something from you. Okay. So that's great. Speaking of learning stuff from you, you have a little tip there for us. Yeah, as promised, I, I try to hold to my promises. So I'm going to show you a tip that I get a lot of calls on during the summer period, and that's high humidity situations. Uh, a lot of my customers in Florida, over the ocean, you know, all over the area where high humidity is an issue, the abrasive flow doesn't work as well. And so I'm going to show you what happens with abrasive, okay? This is Dr. Feinger, right? So this is a 180 silicon carbide. And I made these little miniature pressure pots. All you need is a coffee pot or a coffee cup, rather. You will need a quarter inch drill bit and your abrasive. That's all you need to do this. So what you do is take your coffee cup. It could be a styrofoam cup. could be anything that's easy to puncture with your drill bit. And basically all you're going to do, see what I did here? Put a hole right in the bottom, right in the middle. Okay. That's your quarter inch hole opening. That's what is in the mixing valve on our crystal blast units. So those holes are exactly the same size. All right. So some of you might know where I'm going with this. All right. So when the abrasive falls from the pressure pot, goes into a mixing valve and it goes down below into the chamber down below and then it gets siphoned into an anti-siphon tube. Okay, so that's what that is in there. So if the abrasive flow isn't coming down very smooth or efficiently, then you have clogs and you have a lot of spurts of abrasive, you get sand for a long period, then air only. Uh, then you usually have to do a purge or something like that. So here's a trick you can do right from the start so you never have these situations. and you know, what I would do is make your little pressure pot. And here I just have my lid for my abrasive as my catcher. Something easy. Okay. So I'm dump it right back in afterwards. All right. We have our sand. Basically, you just dump it into there and you're going to see the abrasive flow. All right. So if I, bump, if I dump the abrasive right in the center, see how it pours right out very smooth. That's how it's going to come out of your nozzle as well. Very smooth, very round. As you notice, it's not catching, it's not spurting, it's not doing any of that, right? So this is really good dry abrasive. You will not have an issue in your process with the abrasive flow if you do this test. Because um, sometimes the grid suppliers, not us, because our, all of our packages are fully sealed, some suppliers put their bags on concrete floors, Sometimes the abrasive is not tested ahead of time, so it's damp before you get it. So it's good to test your abrasive before you throw it in your machine. So, and then as you know, when you get low on abrasive, see what happens? See how the spatter is getting a little smaller? And then if I tap the pot, it comes out. That means I'm getting low on my abrasive, okay? So if you look down in the cup, see how that is? Pretty cool, hey? So that's like 10 pounds of abrasive. So that's when you add abrasive, okay? And look at there, now you got your good flow working again. So just a very simple test that you can do with your abrasive flow. If you want, you can kind of look in the center as it's coming out as well. I can't show that on the video, um, but if you see the grit sticking to the sidewalls on your cup, it's gonna stick in the sidewalls inside your pressure pot as well. So that's a sign that your abrasive might be damp, all right? So there's a quick little test how to do that. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you what happens I'm off screen here because I'm gonna plug in my steamer. I'm gonna create humidity, okay? Steamer here. So what I'm gonna do, take one of my pots, all right? Fill this up. Okay. Coming out really nice and smooth. Very good flow. The abrasive is falling on its own. I don't have to tap the pot to get abrasive to come out like some of you may have to do during the high humidity months. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to 
when it's applied to steam, which is basically implementing like humidity in your process. All right, just a little bit of steam. It's basically, like I said, humidity. It's not water. If I put water in here, obviously it would stick right away, right? So I, I don't want to do that. Okay. So here, now if you look in the middle, that abrasive is stuck. Okay, it's not moving anywhere. Now look at it. Now it's kind of chunky. Okay. See how it's kind of breaking now? So this is a test you can do. Well, you're not going to do a test like I'm showing you with humidity. You're just going to do the one test I showed earlier. But just something to look for. So if you see that kind of flow with your abrasive or it's chunking up inside there, chances are you're going to have problems in your blasting down the road. So like I said, just a quick little method to see if your abrasive is good to go. Um, the other uh, thing you can do too is just take a salt shaker. Put your salt shaker out in your work area. If the salt hardens up quickly, then that's a sign you have high humidity as well. But the reason why I do this is because humidity can get into your machine via your air compressor as well. All right. When hot air is created in your compressor, it, the tank is designed to cool the air, kind of the opposite of a water heater. So if the air doesn't have time to cool, let's say you've got a big project going on, you're spitting out hot air, the tank doesn't have time to cool it, you're using that hot air into your system. When the hot air reaches your cold pressure pot, because you're not heating your pot, right? Just sitting there all day long in the cold, and dark, it's going to create moisture inside your pot. And that, that's where you get damp abrasive. So this is another experiment that you can do down the road to scoop up your abrasive in your abrasive hopper and do the same test. If it's coming out smooth, you're good to go. So just a little tip before you start a big project, especially having used the machine in a long period, your abrasive is going to get a little clumpy like this, a little hardened, kind of like salt or sugar does. So do a little uh, coffee cup or whatever you call it. <laughs> Make your own pot and uh, save you a lot of headache down the road, that's for sure. Well, thanks, Dr. Fine Grit, for letting us know how to keep your uh, grit fine. So, yeah. we've oh, got one, some. One, one thing I wanted yes. to mention too on that is I talk about the hot air from your air compressor. If that's the situation, you can get what we call an ambient air dryer. That's what I have on my computer screen, but I'm sure Laura can send out information if you need it. The ambient air dryer cools that hot air from your compressor down to about 67 degrees. So when you have that cool air, you have no damp abrasive. That abrasive flow is going to be very, very smooth, very efficient. So yeah, so if you have an inadequate air compressor or a high humidity environment, I'd highly suggest a ambient air dryer. All right. And if you would like to look into purchasing any of our products, we do have a website or you can call any one of our wonderful sales reps and they're always willing to help you. Uh, our website is iconicsimaging.com and the number is scrolling at the bottom here. It's 1-800-643-1037. Now, that does lead well into some of the questions we've gotten today. We do have a viewer from India wanting to know that how do they purchase products from us um, if they're out of the country? Now, I did mention we do sell internationally, but you'd be more familiar with our areas that we sell to. Yeah. So let's bring that, Darren. Where was the country? I'm sorry. India. India? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have a distributor in India. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the list in front of me. But if you could email us, uh, you can email my email, djones at iconics.com. And I can get them in touch with the appropriate distributor we have out in India. Um, but yeah, we have distributors all over the world. Uh, Germany, India, Australia. Um, we have some in uh, South Africa, Ireland. So yeah, we have variety of uh, distributors with our products. They'll have like the rapid mask, the washout films, and possibly some equipment options. But it, I know the film at least we can help them with in those areas. Okay, that's some great information. Now we're gonna move on to some of the questions uh, involving our video this uh, week for the garden. Mm -hmm. Robert Richards here wants to know, 
what film are you using and are we using the same film on all of the items? The, yeah, great question, Robert. Uh, film, I use R5. I, that's my go-to film on rock and brick because it's very pliable, it's very sticky and you know it's got good resistance of course to get depth um so that's the r5 now what was the second part laura on that one I'm sorry. Uh, if we use the same film on all of the items in this, in, episode. Uh, in this episode yes yes i use r5 on all the objects um you know i try to keep it simple just like this whole 19 series has been 180 mesh abrasive one grit for everything we've done thus far because I don't like to see customers having to change abrasive to do each project. They should never have to do that. So just like with the film, I try to keep it one film, maybe two, uh, based upon your product line to do these. So five mil R5 is my go-to on just about every product unless I need finer detail. All right, that's great. Okay, we have a new viewer, Mark here, wants to know what markers we were using and of course, which ones would you recommend for paint filling yeah um well in this one i used the markers because i was painting on a desk i wasn't in a well ventilated area um you know typically on rock and stone you'll paint with um, like a belt in or a rust-oleum or an automotive enamel and it usually comes in an aerosol can um, but considering i wanted to keep it simple and and do smaller objects I used a Sharpie oil-based marker. Uh, you find these at Michael's or Pearl's, any kind of hobby craft type of store. Um, just the key factor is oil-based. It's gotta be oil-based. Um, if it's not, the water-based product will come right off like your washable markers. So oil-based enamel. Um, so yeah, that's what we used. I, I, I used that for a lot of multicolors primarily. I can do red, yellow, black all at once instead of having to wait between colors and, uh, and smaller objects. I don't want to waste a whole lot of paint and that setup and dry time. So I, I like to use the markers for smaller projects too. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> let me see. How small of a project do you recommend doing? So I noticed the stones are rather small. What's about the smallest size object you'd say you could probably do? Well, good question. Um, jewelry. I don't talk about jewelry much in my episodes, but uh, I've set up a lot of companies over the years, whether it's Tiffany Company or Spice Jewelers out in Baltimore. Um, a big hit back in the day was Pandora bracelets. I don't know if you remember those little pebbles on your wrist. Hmm. Uh, we had customers doing those, putting like initials, you know, dates, birth dates, things like that, right on the Pandora bracelet. Um, golden rings, like your wedding ring, people have done that. Um, but yeah, jewelry items would be probably the smaller, smallest objects I've ever seen. And those, it's funny when I walk in those jewelry places, they're wearing those big eye things with the uh, magnifying glasses, built in their glasses. And they have to, otherwise you can't see the lettering. So our film is really good for detail. I'll give you that. Um, it's, it's amazing what they can do with our film technology. They're really expanding the limits on it, that's for sure. That is for sure. And uh, I know here at Iconics Imaging, you guys are always uh, kind of pushing the limits and seeing what new products you can bring for people to help them realize their creative dreams. Right. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. So we definitely like that. Speaking of that, next week, we're going to bring them some more tips and tricks on how to do some bricks. Uh, I know we had mentioned the crystal, but we got so excited about the stones and rocks that uh, we decided to bring you some more uh, tips and tricks on how to actually do some brick pavers rather than just mention them. So stay tuned for that. And uh, of course, have a blast. But um, anything yeah. else you want to tell them before we sign off and see them next week, Darren? Yeah, uh, covered a good subject today. We're going to carry on the next week with the brick blasting. Um, so looking forward to showing you that episode. But just keep the questions coming in. Uh, I appreciate working with all of you. Um, a lot of technical things on the machines this time of year again with the humidity. 
causing some of the problems. So just uh, keep in touch with us. And if, if just like anything else, if anything takes too long to do, if it's like, there's no way I'm making any money at this, give me a call because there is a way to make money in this world on this process, but you got to know all the steps to get there. And so don't be afraid to call, email, text, FaceTime, watch all my videos. Uh, that's definitely going to help you as well. And I appreciate all of you watching and uh, we'll keep going with these until, you know, until we start to do uh, live seminars again, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, be sure to check our website for any specials on equipment if you're interested in our products and always whatever events that we might actually be at in person, you know, when those happen again, including live workshops with Dr. Feingrit himself. So until then, blast with confidence. Here's, here's, by the way, that's just to show you, this was <laughs> just a full cup of abrasive that we did earlier. And it's all clumpy. So that's what happens. So if I let this sit out for a long period, it'll be fine. But it's, it's that matter of losing that step. So thanks again for watching, everyone. Lots of confidence and always have a blast out there. All right. Take we'll see you next week. week. See you next time.